Welcome back everyone. Uh, this is lecture number three. We will divide this lecture into three parts so it is easier to uh, submit the videos online and potentially it is better for you to study if you have them in parts. Um, so lecture three part one in the first uh, two lectures I have uh, mentioned a book uh, elements and we starting with uh, chapter two chapter two and chapter three will be about uh, elements so what is this uh, uh, book elements uh, elements was created some uh, 2000 years ago um, by Euclid who lived around 330 BC he was one of the scholars in the uh, school of Alexandria city of Alexandria and uh, you can you can think of elements as the very first thorough mathematical uh, textbook uh, in fact uh, a lot of mathematicians and mathematics students do refer to elements as the Bible of mathematics. Now, the book, uh, so the proofs in, in, in elements were not all Euclid's proofs. He furnished some proofs himself and uh, the other proofs were proofs from uh, previous mathematicians. Uh, why Euclid is considered to be a genius in writing this book? Uh, it is because he not only uh, created the very first organized um, text, so to speak, of mathematics, but he, well, not established, but developed the, uh, the field of mathematics uh, of the time in, in an axiomatic way. So, that means that he started with uh, a system of givens, some definitions and some postulates and some common notions and then he simply used those to prove his uh, first proposition, second proposition and then he used the previously proved propositions to prove uh, the results that uh, uh, came next. So uh, nothing was an ambiguous. So the book the book is uh, made of, well, the elements, it's a series of textbooks actually, is made of 13 books, 465 propositions from plane and solid geometry and from number theory. So chapter two deals with the Euclidean geometry part of the book and uh, chapter three will be dealing with the number theory part of um, elements. Okay. So, um, in this first part, I will talk a little bit about uh, definitions, about uh, postulates and common notions. I will write down some of them. I will not write down all of them, obviously. And then, uh, in part two, I will start proving some of the propositions. Some are proved in the book and some are not. Um, and then part three will culminate with actually proving the Pythagorean theorem. Um, I will only prove the propositions or I'll, I'll give a proof of the propositions that we, we shall use uh, finally for the or leading up to the proof of Pythagorean theorem. So here we start. Uh, the book has uh, about 23 definitions. Um, he starts with first defining what a point is, what a line is, what a straight line is, what a circle is, what do we mean by parallel straight lines, and so on. Uh, the very first few definitions, again, keep in mind, this is the system of, these are your givens. This is where you, you take for granted, so to speak, and you take without proofs. Um, so, the very first few definitions may sound a bit weird, but um, this is what uh, Euclid wrote and that's what we are going to actually present. So, uh, let me just write here for the, for the sake of completeness, the book Elements uh, is comprised of 13 books. 
of altogether 465 definitions. I'm sorry, not definitions, but rather propositions. Propositions. Um, there are about 23 definitions in the beginning. Um, five postulates. And five common notions. Five common notions. Okay. Five common notions. All right. So what what is this uh, first definition? What did he call a point? Definition one. A point, a point is that which has no part. Uh, if you think about it, we hardly even um, think in, in modern times as what do we mean by a point, but it, it's, a, it's a concept that geometrically has to be defined. So again, a point, a point is that which has no part is that which has no part. I will certainly not write all definitions. I will write the ones that uh, uh, will be used throughout this lecture and the next one when it comes to uh, propositions that uh, we'll be talking about in a bit. Definition two. Definition two. A line is a breadthless length. So a line is a breadthless length. Definition four, for example. Definition four uh, is talking about what a straight line is. Uh, a straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. Again, this may not sound um, all there, but it is what it is. A straight line, a straight line. It gets a little better in terms of those definitions. I mean, they will sound more and more as what we know them to be. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself evenly with the points on itself. Okay. Um, <clears throat> definition 10, for example, is what we know it to be a, a line segment and not a line segment, I'm sorry, uh, what a right angle is, and then we'll talk about a circle and so on. So, definition 10, definition 10 concerns um, the right angles. So, it's a, it's a rather long definition, so bear with, bear with me. When a straight line is standing on another, straight line makes the adjacent angles equal to one another. Each of the equal angles is right and the straight line standing on the other is called a perpendicular to that on which it stands. I'll write it and then I'll draw a little picture so we can move on. When a straight line, when a 
and straight line. Standing on another straight line. On another straight line. Makes the adjacent angles makes the adjacent angles before I move on this is definition 10 so at this point if we are mentioning angles it means that the angles were defined before definition 10 again it's a lot to write so we are only going to write the ones that uh, we need so makes the adjacent uh, angles equal to one another equal to one another each of the angles each of the angles is right I'll underline that and the straight line and the straight line Standing on the other, standing on the other, is called a perpendicular, is called a perpendicular to that on which it stands. So, a perpendicular. It's the word also that needs to be underlined. So it's perpendicular to that on which it stands. Okay. So that basically means the following. Um, if I have a straight line, I'll, I'll draw it here. If I have a straight line, standing on another straight line standing on another straight line makes the adjacent angles equal to one another and each of the angles is right so it is talking about these two angles and the straight line standing on the other is called a perpendicular to that on which it stands so uh, we have a definition of right angles here and perpendicular lines altogether Moving on to the next um, definition. So the next definition would be definition 15. That is the definition of a circle. Let me just put these three lines here and I'll talk about definition 15. Here we're defining what a circle is. So a circle is a plane figure contained by one line such that all straight lines falling upon it from one point among those lying within the figure are equal to one another. I'll write that and then of course I'll draw a picture. Okay, so a circle. A circle is a plane figure. It's a plane figure contained by one line contained by one line such that such that all straight lines all straight lines falling upon it from one point falling upon it Upon, falling upon it from one point, from one point, among like among those, among those, lying within the figure. 
within the figure are equal to one another. Are equal to one another. Okay. So, uh, is a plane figure contained by one line? This one line, we mean the circumference, really, of a circle, such that all straight lines falling upon it from one point, this one point basically is referred to what we know it to be the center, and these other straight lines falling upon this first line are what we call the radii, or the length of the radius. Okay? Um, so, Is a plane figure contained by one line, so this is the one line we're talking about, the, circ the circumference of the circle, such that all straight lines, uh, we're talking about all straight lines falling upon it, falling upon it, from one point, obviously the center, among those lying within the figure, it's talking about the uh, radii, obviously inside the circle, are equal to one another. So that's definition 15. Uh, next we move on to, I'm going to write them here, so just to make some more space. Um, Definition uh, 19 to 22, those definitions, they actually dealt with uh, triangles, quadrilaterals, equilaterals, triangles, and isosceles triangles. So these definitions had to do with triangles in general, triangles, uh, quadrilaterals. Equilateral triangles, and isosceles triangles. Triangles. Okay, uh, the final definition, which is definition 23, proved to be. Um, a rather critical one. Definition 23 um, is talking about parallel lines. So it is defining what do we mean by two parallel lines. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to say what they are. I'll write it and certainly I'll draw a picture. Uh, so the parallel straight lines, according to Euclid, are straight lines which being in the same plane and being produced indefinitely in both directions do not meet one another in either direction. I'll write that. So, parallel lines parallel lines well, parallel straight lines uh, we mean are straight lines which being in the same plane which being in the same plane and being produced indefinitely and being produced indefinitely uh, in both directions, being produced indefinitely in 
both directions. Do not meet one another in either direction. Um, do not meet one another. in either direction. Um, so, here are two straight lines. In, in the same plane, they are being produced indefinitely. Well, this indicate the, the arrow indicates that you can extend them indefinitely to both direction. And uh, if they never meet on either direction, uh, then they are parallel lines. Uh, so if, if I asked you before giving you this definition, what are two parallel lines? You might have given something along the lines of two lines not being uh, equidistant to one another uh, everywhere. Uh, so Euclid was a little careful in terms of defining uh, parallel lines as being equidistant from one another as the concept of the distant at that time or at this point in the book is not something that was actually uh, defined properly. So uh, let me move on. This is uh, page one. I shall move on to uh, postulates now. So postulates, give me a second until I actually draw my borders again. So this is page two, page two. Uh, postulates are statements that, uh, they are not definitions, but are statements that uh, may look like they need proof, but they don't. You take them for granted as they are stated. Uh, so you don't really contemplate their, their truth. You take them again for granted. So there were far, five postulates. I'll, I'll talk about uh, each of those. Well, almost each of those. So postulate one, uh, it is dealing with uh, straight lines. It says the following. It is possible to draw a straight line from any point to any point. That means you don't, this is self-evident. You don't really need to prove that. If you have two points, you should be able to connect them to one another with a straight line. So that's what we mean by postulate one. So, postulate one. It is possible to draw a straight line A straight line from any point to any point, any point to any point. So if I have some point here, and if I have some point here. It is possible to connect the two by a straight line. Okay. Uh, postulate two. Postulate two. Uh, it says that it is possible to produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. Again, that sounds a bit weird, but. Uh, 
uh, really what Pashley 2 is saying that we can draw a line segment. That's what we mean really in, in modern times by a line segment. So Pashley 2, it is possible. It is possible to draw or produce um, a finite, a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. So the the word the keyword here is finite straight line or rather a segment to draw a finite straight line continuously in a straight line in a straight line okay so if i already have uh, some line It is possible that on it I can consider a chunk. So this is my finite straight line lying continuously in this other uh, uh, straight line that I drew before. So that's the notion of a segment. It says that it is possible to draw a segment. Postulate three. Uh, it says that it is possible to describe a circle within any center and distance. So it is possible to describe a circle. Describe a circle with any center and any distance. Not just a particular circle, but any circle. Uh, centered anywhere and with uh, any uh, length of its radius. So to describe a circle with any center and distance. By distance here we mean the radius. Uh, postulate 4 postulate 4 deals with um, right angles so all right angles are equal to one another again this is something that uh, in modern days we also take for granted we say that if you have two angles that are 90 degrees then they are obviously equal to one another but as I mentioned in the previous lecture the concept of a 90 degree angle or X degree angle uh, was not something that, uh, that that was known so uh, that would be postulate 4 all right angles all right angles are equal to one another to one another. Okay. Now we come to the postulate five, uh, and that certainly is uh, the most controversial statement in Greek mathematics. And I'll explain why in a minute. But first, let me just say what postulate five is. Let me just draw a picture and then I'll explain why this actually was considered to be a very controversial statement uh, for the time. So, postulate five, um, it's supposed to tell you when, um, when two lines are parallel. Well, not when two lines are parallel, but um, anyway, it says the following. If a straight line is falling on two other straight lines and makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, then the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles less than the two right angles. Um, obviously, that's, that's a lot to take in, so let me just uh, write this down and then I'll, I'll draw a picture. So. If a straight line 
keep the straight line, uh, falling on two other straight lines. So as I write along, I'll probably just uh, draw the picture. Falling uh, on two straight lines. So we mean this. Let's say that I have this straight line and let's say that I have this other straight line. So I have these two straight lines and I have another straight line falling falling upon those two. Okay? So so if this straight line falls on this other two straight lines and it makes 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 the interior angles the interior angles on the same side on the same side it is referring the statement is referring to these two angles these are the interior angles on the same side of this straight line okay so you have the two straight lines you have the third one falling upon them and it creates these interior angles on one side of this line. So if these two angles, is saying, are less than uh, two right angles, that means less than 100 degrees in modern notion. Um, so let me just continue writing on the same side. Less than, less than two right angles less than two right angles. The two straight lines, meaning these other two straight lines, the two straight lines, two straight lines, if produced indefinitely on this side, so the two straight lines, if produced, if produced, indefinitely um, on the same side meet on that side meet on that side which uh, on the side on meet on the side on which on which are the angles less than the two right angles less than the two right angles this is basically saying the following so if you have two straight lines and you have another third line falling upon it and if the interior uh, angles on one side are less than two right angles, these other two lines, if produced indefinitely, will certainly meet, meaning they are not parallel. So uh, why is this a controversial statement? Well, Euclid himself and, and so many others after him um, felt uh, that this was not simply something that one has to take for granted without a proof. It sounds actually like, like a theorem that does require a proof. It basically gives you the condition under which two straight lines cannot possibly be parallel. So it requires a proof. Euclid could not give a proof of it. And in fact, he he uh, avoided using uh, postulate five in, in his proofs until, uh, until very, very late in, in the first book, right before he was about to, to prove Pythagorean theorem. So in that sense, postulate five uh, was a controversial statement. So uh, besides the postulate fives, we have the other five common notions. So I'll, I'll uh, 
write them down as well. So common notion one, common notion one, It tells us the following. Things which are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. That may refer to areas, that may refer to magnitudes, length of segments, and so on and so forth. So, things, things that are, or things which are equal to the same thing to the same thing are also equal to one another are also equal to one another common notion two If equals are added to equals, then the wholes are equal. So, again, that refers to any quantity. If equals are, well, be added to, be added to, to equals, the wholes are equal. are equal. Okay. Uh, common notion three. Common notion three. If equals be subtracted from equals, then the remainders are equal. So if equals be subtracted from equals, equals the remainders the remainders are equal and common notion four common notion four Things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. That basically is the same as the concept of congruence. Um, if you have two, let's say, two triangles and you place them on the top of one another and everything matches, we say that these two triangles are congruent. So, um, obviously, this is not talking only about triangles. So, things which coincide with one another. That could be lines, angles, and so on. Things which coincide with one another with one another are equal are equal to one another to one another. Okay, and the last common notion, the whole is certainly greater than the part, and that makes sense. There's not much to, to prove that there, and it's impossible not to take that for granted. The whole is greater than the part. So we talked about definitions, we talked about postulates and the common notions. We shall take those now, some of those, and uh, prove the very first few propositions. Then use those to prove uh, the next one. So that will conclude part one. Uh, I'll get back to you with part two in a minute.